Breathe this in. All of us coming together with hope and with purpose, with faith, all of us knowing that here, somehow joining in the divine dream of a God of love, of hope, of possibility, is our way forward. And so I thank you for being here with me as St. Paul's United Church in Oakville, Ontario, at the dawn of this new year. For thousands of years on this land, the Anishinaabe people, the Attawandron and the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis, and now the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation have known and treasured and nurtured this region. They have known the land and its rhythms, like the crisp, dark nights of winter, giving way to the ever-brightening days. I'm Carolyn Smith, and with Deborah Lafferette, we are thrilled to have you serving and growing with us in this affirming congregation. Today, as we mark the turn of the year, praying with hope and encouraging one another, let's make this time sacred in our worship and in communion. And the sacrament is holy across time and space, carried with the spirit of remembrance and love. As this spirit knows no boundaries, you won't even need something to nibble or sip, but you can if you want to. Today we mark Epiphany, one of my favorite church words, one of light that evokes stars in the dark sky, or the sparkle of sun on snow, of wise ones seeking, and aha moments of discovery and revelation. It can be radiant and glorious, like heaven on earth, or it can also be soft, hibernating, gentle, like the moon against indigo sky. And we all found our way here with prayers for this new year, with hope in this St. Paul circle. So let's gather our candles, let's light our candles. You've got yours, or you can share in this one with me. And as it flickers to life, adding its light, it sends peace to this world, peace to you, peace to the loved ones that you have and are thinking about today. And I wish you the peace of Christ. Will you pray with me? Radiant God, wonderful counselor, as Christmas turns to this crisp, fresh year, may we cradle its gifts close and carry them forward. We found our way here together, so we pray, O oh God, that this St. Paul's family holds your dream at our center, bringing heaven on earth to our community. And as the rhythm of this season can mean hibernation, and this strange time demands it, Give us glimmers in our dreams, gifts in our resting, compassion in our distance. Hear our prayers, O God, and encourage us against the cold as light everlasting. Amen. On this day that we celebrate Epiphany, we will read from the second chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the story of the Magi and their search for the Messiah. We will read verses 1 to 15 in the Common English Bible. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them this time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I, I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went. And look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them 
until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chest and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went, they went back to their own country by another route. When the Magi had departed, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I have called my son out of Egypt. May God grant us understanding of this holy text. Let us pray. May the words from my lips and the meditations of my heart be guided by your spirit and be words of wisdom for this day. Amen. On Christmas Eve at the 10 p.m. service, I mentioned that I loved that time of night, especially on Christmas Eve when everything gets so quiet and there's a note of expectancy in the air. But even when it's not Christmas Eve, I love the nighttime, when we can see the stars and the moon, and there's a quiet hush that settles onto the earth. I love a good night's sleep. I love campfires and singing in the dark. I'm not as appreciative at the length of those dark days in the winter time, but I do appreciate the qualities in the night and in the darkness. Do you know how difficult it is to find hymns that celebrate darkness? Most celebrate light. Christians call Jesus the light of the world. Our epiphany hymns today talk about gleaming lights and shining splendor. I came across a couple of secular hymns that stood out like Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk to you again by Simon and Garfunkel. And another written by Gordon Lightfoot, made famous by Sarah McLaughlin. The lamp is burning low upon my tabletop. The snow is softly falling. The air is still in the silence of my room. I hear your voice softly calling. In the church and in our wider secular society, we tend to use light and dark as opposing forces, light as good and dark as bad. We equate light with purity, goodness, and awareness, and dark with evil, maliciousness, and closed-mindedness. Now, we could attribute this to the fact that humans are day creatures and that we tend to fear what we cannot see. Unfortunately, though, it's become more than that. I want to read for you a quote from the Reverend Anthony D. Bailey, a black minister who is currently at Parkdale United Church in Ottawa. He writes this. The problem that the United Church's anti-racism policy is trying to address has to do with what is called the racialization of the terms white and black. This occurred when some of, some of the leading European Enlightenment philosophers, academics, and scientists arbitrarily assigned the positive and pure characteristics of the term light to white people i.e. Europeans, and described to non-Europeans, including the brown and black peoples of the world, the negative characteristics of the term dark. In the 1700s, German philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote, humanity is at its greatest perfection in the race of the whites. 
The yellow Indians do have a meager talent. The Negroes are far below at the lowest point. Before this time, the positive and negative aspects of light and dark were not systematically assigned to different peoples. Once this separation of peoples based on race became entrenched in education, science, economic, social, and political policies, and activities of colonial conquest and enslavement, it was virtually impossible to use these terms in ways void of a racist agenda. Over the years, I have become more and more aware of how our language exhibits our racist society. Words like blackmail, black-hearted, calling something black as sin, or when we call a movie or a piece of music dark. When we constantly use these words in negative ways, they take a toll on a people who are already feeling the weight of oppression and discrimination. Adele Halliday, the anti-racism and equity officer with the United Church of Canada, asked the question, how then do we speak of darkness and light? Are we simply too sensitive? Do we throw out all biblical references to light? Surely not. What we need is balance. She continues, in reality, darkness can be seen as comfort, as a refugee is fleeing a time of war and unrest. Light in this circumstance could lead to death. Darkness could be seen as a wonder to explore, full of holy mystery. Light could be seen as a harsh reality, revealing a blinding light. Let's look at the Bible story we heard today. It is the story of the Magi who are following a star to find the child who has been born King of the Jews. The Magi get to Judea and visit King Herod, a part of the story that we often leave out. When King Herod hears of a child born to be king, he gets scared. He feels threatened. He asked these magi from the east to come back to him after they've found this child so that he too can pay homage. But the magi are warned in a dream not to return to Herod. When they don't return, Herod comes up with a scheme to remove this threat to his power. Verse 16 the verse immediately following the passage we heard today, where we heard that Joseph was warned in a dream to leave Bethlehem right away, we read, When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. I imagine that when Joseph received this dream, he packed up his family and under cover of night fled to Egypt. They became refugees, fleeing from the tyranny of a despot. Night was their friend, hiding them as they ran. In fact, Many families probably hid and ran, hoping the nighttime would protect their children from the king. In the story of the birth of Christ, we have magi traveling at night, following a star, and we have Joseph using the night to flee to safety. In one story, the night is needed to illuminate a guiding star while in the other, it's needed to protect and cover. Light and dark are not opposing realities. They are not set against each other. We need both and all that is in between. 
They are part of a spectrum, from the many hues and colors of our skin to the times of day, dusk to dawn, sunset to sunrise. This is why I like Adele Halliday's idea of balance. If we only focus on the light, only see the light as good, only see the color white to symbolize peace and resurrection, then we are missing out on a vast amount of other helpful imagery. The songs we sing during Christmas, like It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, Still, 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 and Silent Night, recall the images of peace and goodwill, angels and stars in the night sky. When we talk about resurrection, there are those three days we often skip over between death and resurrection. What is happening in that silence, in that dark tomb? Darkness can mean mystery, rest, Sabbath, preparation, expectancy, and hope. I'll leave you with one last image that I found meaningful this week. As we leave this season of Christmas, this season of expectancy of a new birth, and look towards Lent and Easter, I leave you with words from Barbara Holmes, a black theologian teaching at the Center for Action and Contemplation in Arizona. She writes, as an African-American woman, I wear darkness as a skin color that I love. It is a reminder of my African origins, hidden in my genes, but not accessible through memory. Without darkness, I would not be. I entered the world from the nurturing darkness of the womb and relied upon a dark and resourceful family, community, and cosmos for my well-being. We come from the darkness and return to it. On this Epiphany Sunday, when we celebrate the arrival of the Magi and celebrate the light, May we also celebrate darkness and all that lies between. May we honor our black linen as much as our white. May we continue to celebrate the stars and remember to celebrate the darkness that illuminates those stars. May the sun and the moon be our companions. May we give thanks for the many silent nights and holy nights that bring us peace and stillness and the possibility of a new day. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Well, hello, St. Paul's, and Happy New Year. What a great day to stay home and worship with all the snow on the ground. Um, I hope you aren't missing Jeff and Jay. I did give them the Sunday off. It's, uh, it's been a quiet week, and there weren't a lot of announcements. So hello, Jeff and Jay, if you're watching, and hopefully we'll see you next week. I do have just uh, one announcement that I want to share with you today, and some of you have seen this already. But the Office of Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Mary Simon, Governor General of Canada, named Captain Judy Cameron as one of the newest appointees to the Order of Canada. I'll put up her picture here. There we go. Judy Cameron became the first female pilot hired by Air Canada, Canada's largest airline, in April 1978 at the age of 23. So just want to recognize that. Uh, Judy and her family have been a part of St. Paul's for a number of years, and we take this time to celebrate this great honor. Congratulations, Judy. And that's the only announcement. So next, I'll just say that we're going to move on to our communion liturgy. As uh, Carolyn mentioned earlier, you don't need food and drink, but you're welcome to have some with you if you'd like. This is a, a liturgy that we used last year during Christmas Eve called, the, uh, called Communion of the Empty Hands. And it visits a group of people who celebrated communion without bread, without wine. So I invite you to join with Carolyn and I as we celebrate this special sacrament. Not so many years ago, there were a group of faithful Christians who found each other while held in a dark and difficult Argentinian prison. Each had been active in the pursuit of justice in their country and had now found themselves imprisoned for a Christmas Eve like no other. Many of us don't know the experience of an Argentine prison, but we can relate to a Christmas of separation, of loneliness, of worry. For these prisoners, there was no family gathered or festive meal. There were no laughing children or church to attend, no gifts given or received. Still, as they met that evening in the prison courtyard, one among them said, Come, let us gather together for communion. Another said, But how shall we do that? We have no cup, no wine. We have no bread. And the other said, Come, we shall have a communion of the empty hands. Peace. 
and they gathered in a circle in the prison yard. One repeated these words from memory. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not cling to this, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant born in human likeness. And as human, he humbled himself and faced death, even death on a cross. And another remembered this. Truly I say to you, if you ask anything of the Holy One, it will be given to you in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be made full. And then they pray together that they might be moved from fear to faith, that their emptiness be made full by God's love, that Christ's spirit might be present in the brokenness of their lives for others. One among them lifted their hands and said, On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. Whenever you share with the least of my sisters and brothers, you share it with me. And they lifted their hands together and received the bread. Of Christ. You are invited now to reach out your empty hands to receive this gift of bread. And after supper, Jesus took the wine and after giving thanks said, This is the cup of the new covenant. This is the life of the new age coming, shed for you and for many. Drink this in promise and foretaste of when we shall drink it together in laughter. And they lifted their hands and received the cup of salvation. Reach out your empty hands to receive the gift of life. Of the empty hands is witness to the truth that abundant life is always available to us. It is not something we can grasp or clutch. Fullness and abundance comes to us to the extent that we can become empty.
us pray together. O risen Christ, you made yourself known to the disciples in the breaking of the bread at Emmaus and to the disciples gathered for the communion of empty hands in that prison yard in Argentina. Make yourself known to us as we learn to break open our lives for one another and for the stranger. Make yourself known in the self-emptying and trusting of our hearts and lives to you. Make yourself known to us in our places of fear, distrust, and captivity. Create in us, O oh God, a courageous trust in your mystery, born into the world this day. Open our hearts and empty them, so that your compassion may fill them full. In emptying ourselves, may we discover that your faithfulness is at the heart of all things. We pray in thanksgiving for the way that has been opened before us, for the light that shines for us, and for our companions who give us courage and strength to keep us on the way. Amen. We now come to the end of our service. Um, I'm glad all of you were able to be here this morning. Now go out and enjoy the snow. Um, maybe after Zoom though. We will have a Zoom coffee hour right after worship. The link is on the website. Um, if you can't find that newsletter from a couple of weeks ago, it's on the website as well if you can find the link. I'm just going to offer a blessing. May we all appreciate the gifts that are found in the light and in the darkness. May we know that God, our creator, blessed all of creation, naming all as very good. May the light be your guide and the darkness our companion as we work towards a world of peace and justice in this new year and beyond. Amen.